11. What was the matter with the master at arms? And be the matter what it might... How could it have direct relation to Billy Budd, with whom prior to the affair of the spilled soup, he had never come into any special contact official or otherwise? What indeed could the trouble have to do with one so little inclined to give offence as the merchant ship's peacemaker, even him who, in Claggart's own phrase, was the sweet and pleasant young fellow? Yes, why should Jimmy Legs, to borrow the dankster's expression, be down on the handsome sailor? But at heart, and not for nothing, as the late chance encounter may indicate to the discerning, down on him, secretly down on him, he assuredly was. Now, to invent something touching the more private career of Claggart, something involving Billy Budd, of which something the latter should be wholly ignorant, some romantic incident implying that Claggart's knowledge of the young blue jacket began at some period anterior to catching sight of him on board the 74. All this, not so difficult to do, might avail in a way more or less interesting to account for whatever and of enigma may appear to lurk in the case. But in fact, there was nothing of the sort. And yet the cause necessarily to be assumed as the sole one assignable is in its very realism as much charged with that prime element of Radcliffian romance, the mysterious, as any that the ingenuity of the author of the Mysteries of Udolpho could devise. For what can more partake of the mysterious than an antipathy spontaneous and profound such as is evoked in certain exceptional mortals by the mere aspect of some other mortal, however harmless he may be, if not called forth by this very harmlessness itself. Now, there can exist no irritating juxtaposition of dissimilar personalities comparable to that which is possible aboard a great warship, fully manned and at sea. There, every day, among all ranks, almost every man comes into more or less of contact with almost every other man, wholly there to avoid even the sight of an aggravating object, one must needs give it Jonah's toss or jump overboard himself. Imagine how all this might eventually operate on some peculiar human creature, the direct reverse of a saint. But for the adequate comprehending of Claggart, by a normal nature, these hints are insufficient. To pass from a normal nature to him, one must cross the deadly space between. And this is best done by indirection. Long ago, an honest scholar, my senior, said to me, in reference to one who, like himself, is now no more a man so unimpeachably respectable that against him nothing was ever openly said, though among the few something was whispered, yes, X, blank, is a nut, or not to be cracked by the tap of a lady's fan. You are aware that I am the adherent of no organized religion, much less of any philosophy built into a system. Well, for all that, I think that to try and get into X, blank, enter the, his labyrinth, and get out again, without a clue derived from some source other than what is known as knowledge of the world, that were hardly possible, at least for me. Why, said I, 
X blank, however singular a study to some, is yet human, and knowledge of the world assuredly implies the knowledge of human nature, and in most of its varieties. Yes, but a superficial knowledge of it serving ordinary purposes. But for anything deeper, I am not certain whether to know the world and to know human nature be not two distinct branches of knowledge, which while they may coexist in the same heart, yet either may exist with little or nothing of the other. Nay, in an average man of the world, his constant rubbing with it blunts that finer spiritual insight indispensable to the understanding of the essential in certain exceptional characters, whether evil ones or good. In a matter of some importance, I have seen a girl wind an old lawyer about her little finger. Nor was it the dotage of senile love, nothing of the sort, but he knew law better than he knew the girl's heart. Coke and black stone hardly shed so much light into obscure spiritual places as the Hebrew prophets, and who were they? Mostly recluses. At the time, my inexperience was such that I did not quite see the drift of all this. It may be that I see it now. And indeed, if that lexicon, which is based on holy writ, were any longer popular, one might with less difficulty define and denominate certain phenomenal men. As it is, one must turn to some authority not liable to the charge of being tinctured with the biblical element. In a list of definitions, including in the authentic translation of Plato, a list attributed to him occurs this, natural depravity, a depravity according to nature, a definition which, though savoring of Calvinism, by no means involves Calvin's dogma as to total mankind. Evidently, its intent makes it applicable but to individuals. Not many are the examples of this depravity which the gallows and jail supply, at any rate for notable instances, since these have no vulgar alloy of the brute in them, but invariably are dominated by intellectuality, one must go elsewhere. Civilization, especially if the ost Civilization, especially if of the austerior sort, is auspicious to it. It folds itself in the mantle of respectability. It has certain negative virtues serving as silent auxiliaries. It never allows wine to get within its guard. It is not going too far to say that it is without vices or small sins. There is a phenomenal pride in it that excludes them. It is never mercenary or avaricious. In short, the depravity here meant partakes nothing of the sordid or sensual. It is serious but free of acerbity. Though no flatterer of mankind, it never speaks ill of it. But the thing which in eminent instances signalizes so exceptional a nature is this.
though the man's even temper and discreet bearing would seem to intimate a mind peculiarly subject to the law of reason, not the less in heart he would seem to riot in complete exemption from the law, having apparently little to do with reason further than to employ it as ambidexter implement for effecting the irrational. That is to say, toward the accomplishment of an aim which is in wantonness of atrocity would seem to partake of the insane. He will direct a cool judgment, sagacious and sound. These men are madmen, and of the most dangerous sort, for their lunacy is not continuous, but occasional. Evoked by some special object, it is protectively secretive, which is as much as to say it is self-contained, so that when, moreover, most active it is to the average mind not distinguishable from sanity, and for the reason above suggested, that whatever its aims may be, and the aim is never declared, the method and the outward proceeding are always perfectly rational. Now something such, and one was Clagart, in whom was the mania of an evil nature, not engendered by vicious training or corrupting books or licentious living, but born with him, an innate, in short, a depravity according to nature. Dark sayings are these, some will say. But why? Is it because they somewhat savor the holy writ in its phrase, mystery of iniquity? If they do, such savor was far enough from being intended, for little will it commend these pages to many a reader of today. The point of the present story, turning on the hidden nature of the Master at Arms, has necessitated this chapter with an added hint or two in connection with the incident at the mess. The resumed narrative must be left to vindicate, as it may, its own credibility. Twelve. That Claggart's figure was not amiss, and his face, save the chin, well moulded, has already been said. Of these favourable points he seemed not insensible, for he was not only neat but careful in his dress. But the form of Billy Budd was heroic, and if his face was without the intellectual look of the pallid claggarts, not the less was it lit, like his, from within, though from a different source. The bonfire in his heart made luminous the rose tan in his cheek. In view of the marked contrast between the persons of the twain, it is more than probable that when the master-at-arms in the scene last given applied to the sailor the proverb, handsome is as handsome does, he there let escape an ironic inkling, not caught by the young sailors who heard it, as to what it was that had first moved him against Billy, namely his significant personal beauty. Now envy and antipathy, passions irreconcilable in reason, nevertheless, in fact, may spring conjoined, like Chang and Eng in one birth. Is envy then such a monster? Well, though many an arraigned mortal has, in hopes of mitigated penalty, pleaded guilty to horrible actions, did ever anybody seriously confess to envy? 
Something there is in it university felt to be more shameful than even felonious crime. And not only does everybody disown it, but the better sort are inclined to incredulity when it is in earnest imputed to an intelligent man. But since its lodgment is in the heart, not the brain, no degree of intellect supplies a guarantee against it. But Claggart's was no vulgar form of the passion, nor as directed toward Billy Budd did it partake of the streak of apprehensive jealousy that marred Saul's visage, perturbedly brooding on the comely young David. Claggart's envy struck deeper. If asconce, he eyed the good looks, cheery health, and frank enjoyment of young life in Billy Budd. was because these went along with the nature that, as Claggart magnetically felt, had in its simplicity never willed malice or experienced the reactionary bite of that serpent. To him, the spirit lodged within Billy, and looking out from his welkin eyes as from windows, that affability it was which made the dimple in his dyed cheek, supplied his joints, and dancing in his yellow curls, made him preeminently the handsome sailor. One person accepted the master-at-arms was perhaps the only man in the ship intellectually capable of adequately appreciating the moral phenomenon presented in Billy Budd, and the insight but intensified his passion, which, assuming various secret forms within him, at times assumed that of cynic disdain, disdain of innocence, to be nothing more than innocent. Yet in an aesthetic way, he saw the charm of it, the courageous, free and easy temper of it, and Fane would have shared it, but he despaired of it. With no power to annul the elemental evil in him, though readily enough he could hide it, apprehending the good, but powerless to be it, a nature like Claggart's surcharged with energy, as such natures almost invariably are. What recourse is left to it but to recoil upon itself, and, like the scorpion for which the Creator alone is responsible, act out to the end the part allotted it. Thirteen. Passion, and passion in its profoundest, is not a thing demanding a palatial stage whereon to play its part. Down among the groundlings, among the beggars and rakers of the garbage, profound passion is enacted. And the circumstances that provoke it, however trivial or mean, are no measure of its power. In the present instance, the stage is a scrubbed gun deck, and one of the external provocations a man-of-war's man's spilled soup. Now, when the master-at-arms noticed whence came the greasy fluid streaming before his feet, he must have taken it, to some extent, willfully, 
perhaps not for the mere accident it assuredly was, but for the sly escape of a spontaneous feeling on Billy's part, more or less answering to the antipathy of his own. In effect, a foolish demonstration, he must have thought, and very harmless, like the futile kick of a heifer, which yet, were the heifer a shod stallion, should not be so harmless. Even so was it that, into the gall of Claggart's envy, he infused the vitriol of his contempt. But the incident confirmed to him certain tell-tale reports prevailed to his ear by Squeak, one of his more cunning corporals. A grizzled little man, so nicknamed by the sailors on account of his squeaky voice and sharp visage ferreted about the dark corners of the lower decks after interlopers, satirically suggesting to them the idea of a rat in a cellar. From his chiefs employing him as an implicit tool in laying little traps for the warrament of the foretopmen, for it was from the master at arms that the petty persecutions here tofore averted to had proceeded, the corporal having naturally enough concluded that his master could have no love for the sailor made it his business, faithful understrapper that he was, to foment the ill blood by perverting to his chief certain innocent frolics of the good nature for top men, besides inventing for his mouth sundry contumelious epithets he claimed to have overheard him let fall. The master-at-arms never suspected the veracity of these reports, more especially as to the epithets, for he well knew how secretly unpopular may become a master-at-arms, at least a master-at-arms of those days, zealous in his function, and how the blue jackets shoot at him in private their raillery and wit. The nickname by which he goes among them, Jemmy Legs, implying under the form of merriment their cherished disrespect and dislike. But in view of the greediness of hate for Pabulum, it hardly needed a purveyor to feed Claggart's passion. An uncommon prudence is habitual with the subtler depravity for it has everything to hide, and in case of an injury but suspected, its secretiveness voluntarily cuts it off from enlightenment or disillusion, and not unreluctantly. Action is taken upon surmise as upon certainty, and the retaliation is apt to be a monstrous disproportion to the supposed offence, for when in anybody was revenge in its exactions aught else but an indoor ordinate user. But But how with Claggart's conscience? For though consciences are unlike as foreheads, every intelligence, not excluding the scriptural devils who believe and tremble, has one. 
But Claggart's conscience, being but the lawyer to his will, made ogres and trifles, probably arguing that the motive imputed to Billy in spilling the soup just when he did, together with the epithets alleged, these, if nothing more, made a strong case against him, nay, justified animosity into a sort of retributive righteousness. The Pharisee is the Guy Fox prowling in the hid chambers underlying some natures like Claggart's, and they can really form no conception of an unreciprocated malice. Probably the Master of Arms' clandestine persecution of Billy was started to try the temper of the man, but it had not developed any quality in him that enmity could make official use of or even pervert into plausible self-justification, so that the occurrence at the mess, petty if it were, was a welcome one to that peculiar conscience assigned to be the private mentor of Claggart, and for the rest, not improbably, it put him upon new experiments. Not many days after the last incident narrated, something befell Billy Bud that more graveled him than aught that had previously occurred. It was a warm night for the latitude, and the foretop man, whose watch at the time was properly below, was dozing on the uppermost deck, whither he had ascended from his hot hammock, one of hundreds suspended so closely wedged together over a lower gun deck that there was little or no swing to them. He lay as in the shadow of a hillside, stretched under the lee of the booms, a piled ridge of spare spars amidships between foremast and mainmast, among which the ship's largest boat, the launch, was stowed. Alongside of three other slumberers from below, he lay near that end of the booms which approaches the foremast, his station aloft on duty as a foretopman being just over the deck station of the forecastlemen, entitled him, according to usage, to make himself more or less at home in that neighborhood. Presently he was stirred into semi-consciousness by somebody who must have previously sounded the sleep of the others, touching his shoulder, and then, as the foretopman raised his head, breathing into his ear in a quick whisper, Slip into the lee, four chains. Billy, there is something in the wind. Don't speak. Quick, I will meet you there, and disappearing. Now Billy, like sundry other essentially good-natured ones, had some of the weaknesses inseparable from essential good nature, and among these was a reluctance, almost an incapacity, of plumply saying no to an abrupt proposition not obviously absurd on the face of it, nor obviously unfriendly, or iniquitous. And being of warm blood, he had not the phlegm tacitly to negative any proposition by unresponsive inaction. Like his sense of fear, his apprehension as to aught outside of the honest and natural, was seldom very quick. Besides, upon the present occasion, the drowse from his sleep still hung upon him. However, it was, he mechanically rose, and, sleepily wondering what 
could be in the world, betook himself to the designated place, a narrow platform, one of six, outside of the high bulwarks, and screened by the great dead eyes and multiple columned lanyards of the shrouds and backstays, and in a great warship of that time, of dimensions commensurate to the whole's magnitude, a tarry balcony in short, overhanging the sea, and so secluded that one mariner of the bellipotent, a nonconformist old tar of a serious turn, made it even in daytime his private oratory. In this retired nook, the stranger soon joined Billy Budd. There was no moon as yet. A haze obscured the starlight. He could not distinctly see the stranger's face. Yet from something in the outline and carriage, Billy took him, and correctly, for one of the afterguard. Hist, Billy, said the man in the same quick cautionary whisper as before. You were impressed, weren't you? Well, so was I. And he paused as to mark the effect. But Billy, not knowing exactly what to make of this, said nothing. Then the other, We are not the only impressed ones, Billy. There's a gang of us. Couldn't you help at a pinch? What do you mean? demanded Billy, here thoroughly shaking off his drowse. Hist! Hist! the hurried whisper now growing husky. See here! And the man held up two small objects faintly twinkling in the nightlight. See, they are yours. Billy, if only you... But Billy broke in, and in his resentful eagerness to deliver himself his vocal infirmity, somewhat intruded. D -d 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 Damn! I don't know what you are d -d -d driving at, or what you mean, but you had better g -g 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 go where you belong. For the moment, the fellow, as confounded, did not stir, and Billy, springing to his feet, said, If you d -d don't start, I'll t -t toss you back over the rail. There was no mistaking this, and the mysterious emissary decamped, disappearing in the direction of the main mast, in the shadow of the booms. Hello, what's the matter? Here came growling from a forecastle man, awakened from his deck doze by Billy's raised voice. And as the foretop man reappeared and was recognized by him, Ah, beauty, is it you? Well, something must have been the matter for you to st st stuttered. Oh, rejoined Billy, now mastering the impediment, I found an after-guardsman in our part of the ship here, and I bid him be off where he belongs. And is that all you did about it? For Topman, gruffly demanding another and irascible old fellow of brick-colored visage and hair who was known to his associate forecastle men as Red Pepper. Such sneaks I should like to marry to the gunner's daughter by the expression meaning that he would like to subject them to disciplinary castigation over again. However, Billy's rendering of the matter satisfactorily accounted to these inquirers for their brief commotion, since of all the sections of the ship's company and forecastlemen, veterans for the most part, and bigoted in their sea prejudices, are the most jealous in resenting territorial encroachments, especially on the part of any of the afterguard, of whom they have but a sorry opinion, chiefly landsmen, never going aloft except to reef or furl the mainsail, and in no wise competent to handle a marlin spike or turn in a dead-eye, say.
15. This incident sorely puzzled Billy Budd. It was an entirely new experience, the first time in his life that he had ever been personally approached in underhand, in intriguing fashion. Prior to this encounter, he had known nothing of the afterguardmanship, the two men being stationed wide apart, one forward and aloft during his watch, the other on deck and aft. What could it What could it mean? And could they really be guineas? Those two glittering objects the interloper had held up to his Billy's eyes? Where could the fellow get guineas? Why, even spare buttons are not so plentiful at sea. The more he turned the matter over, the more he was nonplussed and made uneasy and discomfited in his disgustful recoil from an overture which, though he but ill comprehended, he instinctively knew must involve evil of some sort. Billy Budd was like a young horse, fresh from the pasture, suddenly inhaling a vile whiff from some chemical factory, and by repeated snortings trying to get it out of his nostrils and lungs. This frame of mind barred all desire of holding farther parley with the fellow, even were it but for the purpose of gaining some enlightenment as to his design in approaching him. And yet he was not without natural curiosity to see how such a visitor in the dark would look in broad day. He espied him, the following afternoon in his first dog watch below, one of the smokers on that forward part of the upper gun deck allotted to the pipe. He recognized him by his general cut and build more than by his round freckled face and glassy eyes of pale blue, veiled with lashes but white. And yet Billy was a bit uncertain whether indeed it were he yonder chap about his own age, chatting and laughing in free-hearted way, leaning against a gun, a genial young fellow enough to look at, and something of a rattle-brain to all appearance. Rather chubby, too, for a sailor, even an after-guardsman. In short, the last man in the world, one would think, to be overburdened with thoughts, especially those perilous thoughts, that must needs belong to a conspirator in any serious project, or even to the underling of such a conspirator. Although Billy was not aware of it, the fellow, with a sidelong watchful glance, had perceived Billy first, and then noting that Billy was looking at him, thereupon nodded a familiar sort of friendly recognition, as to an old acquaintance, without interpreting the talk he was engaged in with the group of smokers. A day or two afterwards, chancing in the evening promenade on a gun deck to pass Billy, he offered a flying word of good fellowship, as it were, which by its unexpectedness and equivocalness under the circumstances so embarrassed Billy that he knew not how to respond to it, and let it go unnoticed. Billy was now left more at a loss than before. The ineffectual speculations into which he was led were so disturbingly alien to him that he did his best to smother them. It never entered his mind that 
Here was a matter which, from its extreme questionableness, it was his duty as a loyal blue jacket to report in the proper quarter, and probably, had such a step been suggested to him, he would have been deterred from taking it by the thought, one of novice magnanimity, that it would savor over much of the dirty work of the telltale. He kept the thing to himself, yet upon one occasion he could not forbear a little disburdening himself to the old dansker, tempted thereto perhaps by the influence of a balmy night when the ship lay becalmed, the twain silent for the most part, sitting together on deck, their heads propped against the bulwarks. But it was only a partial and anonymous account that Billy gave, the unfounded scruples above referred to preventing full disclosure to anybody. Upon hearing Billy's version, the sage Dansker seemed to divine more than he was told, and after a little meditation, during which his wrinkles were pursed as into a point quite effacing for the time that quizzing expression his face sometimes wore, didn't I say so, baby bud? Say what? demanded Billy. Why, Jimmy Legs is down on you. And what, rejoined Billy in amazement, has Jimmy Legs to do with that cracked after guardsman? Oh, it was an after guardsman then. A cut's paw, a cut's paw. And with that exclamation, whether it had reference to a light puff of air just then coming over the calm sea, or a subtler relation to the after guardsman, there is no telling. The old Merlin gave a twisting wrench with his black teeth at his plug of tobacco, vouchsafing no reply to Billy's impetuous question, though not repeated, for it was his wont to relapse into grim silence when interrogated, in skeptical sort, as to any of his sententious oracles, not always very clear ones, rather partaking of that obscurity which invests most Delphic deliverances from any quarter. Long experience had very likely brought this old man to the bitter prudence which never interferes in aught and never gives advice. 16. Yes, despite the Dansker's pithy insistence as to the master of arms being at the bottom of these strange experiences of Billy on board, the Bellipotent, the young sailor was ready to ascribe them to almost anybody but the man who, to use Billy's own expression, always had a pleasant word for him. This is to be wondered at, yet not so much to be wondered at. In certain matters, some sailors, even in mature life, remain unsophisticated enough, but a young seafarer, of the disposition of our athletic foretopmen is much of a child man, and yet a child's utter innocence is but its blank ignorance, and the innocence more or less wanes as intelligence waxes. But in Billy Budd, intelligence, such as it was, had advanced, yet his simple-mindedness remained for the most part unaffected. Experience is a teacher indeed, yet did Billy's years make his experience small. Besides, he had none of that intuitive no knowledge of the bad which is in nature's not good or incompletely so foreruns experience, and therefore may pertain, as in some instances it too clearly does pertain, even to youth. And what could Billy know of man except of man as a mere sailor, and the old-fashioned sailor, the veritable man before the mast, the sailor from boyhood, up, he, though indeed of the same species as a landsman, is in some respects singularly distinct from him. The sailor is frankness, the landsman is finesse. Life is not a game with the sailor, 
demanding the long head. No intricate games of chess where few moves are made in straightforwardness and ends are attained by indirection. An oblique, tedious, barren game hardly worth that poor candle burnt out in playing it. Yes, as a class, sailors are in character a juvenile race. Even their deviations are marked by juvenility, this more especially holding true with the sailors of Billy's time. Then, too, certain things which apply to all sailors do more pointedly operate here and there upon the junior one. Every sailor, too, is accustomed to obey orders without debating them. His life afloat is extremely ruled for him. He is not brought into that promiscuous commerce with mankind where unobstructed free agency, on equal terms, equal superficially, at least, soon teaches one that unless upon occasion he exercise a distrust keen in proportion to the fairness of the appearance, some foul turn may be served him. A ruled undemonstrative distrustfulness is so habitual, not with businessmen, so much as with men who know their kind in less shallow relations than business, namely certain men of the world that they come at last to employ it all but unconsciously, and some of them would very likely feel real surprise at being charged with it as one of their general characteristics. Seventeen. But after the little matter at the mess, Billy Budd no more found himself in strange trouble at times about his hammock or his clothes bag or what not. As to that smile that occasionally sunned him and the pleasant passing word, these were, if not more frequent, yet if anything, more pronounced than before. But for all that, there were certain other demonstrations now, when Claggart's unobscured glance happened to light on belated Billy rolling along the upper gun deck in the leisure of the second dog watch, exchanging passions, broadsides of fun, and other young promianders in the crowd. That glance would follow the cheerful sea Hyperion with a settled meditative and melancholy expression his eyes strangely suffused with incipient feverish tears. Then would Claggart look like the man of sorrows. Yes, and sometimes the melancholy expression would have it in a touch of soft yearning, as if Claggart could even have loved Billy, but for fate and ban. an evanescence and quickly repented of, as it were, by an immitigable look, pinching and shriveling the visage into the momentary semblance of a wrinkled walnut, but sometimes catching sight in advance of the four topmen coming in his direction. He would, upon their nearing, step aside a little to let him pass, dwelling upon Billy for the moment with the glittering dental satire of a guise, but upon any abrupt, unforeseen encounter, a red light would flash forth from his eye, like a spark from an anvil in a dusk smithy. That quick, fierce light was a strange one, darted from orbs which, in repose, were of a color nearest approaching a deeper violet, the softest of shades. Though some of these caprices of the pit could not but be observed by their object, yet were they beyond the 
construing of such a nature. And the thews of Billy were hardly compatible with that sort of sensitive spiritual organization, which in some cases instinctively conveys to ignorant innocence an admonition of the proximity of the malign. He thought the master-at-arms acted in a manner rather queer at times, that was all. But the occasional frank air and pleasant word went for what they purported to be the young sailor, never having heard as yet of the too fair spoken man. Had the four topmen been conscious of having done or said anything to provoke the ill will of the official, it would have been different with him, and his sight might have been purged if not sharpened. As it was, innocence was his blinder. So was it with him in yet another matter. Two minor officers, the armorer and captain of the hold, with whom he had never exchanged a word, his position in the ship not bringing him into contact with him. These men now for the first began to cast upon Billy, when they chanced to encounter him, that peculiar glance which evidences that the man from whom it comes has been some way tampered with, and to the prejudice of him upon whom the glance lights. Never did it occur to Billy as a thing to be noted or a thing suspicious, though he well knew the fact that the armorer and captain of the hold with the ship's yeoman apothecary, and others of that grade, were by naval usage messmates of the master of arms, men with ears convenient to his confidential tongue. But the general popularity that came from the handsome sailor's manly forwardness upon occasion and irresistible good nature, indicating no mental superiority, tending to excite an invidious feeling, this goodwill on the part of most of his shipmates made him the less to concern himself about such mute aspects toward him as those whereto allusion has just been made aspects he could not so fathom as to infer their whole import. As to the after-guardsman, though Billy, for reasons already given necessarily, saw little of him, yet when the two did happen to meet, Invariably came the fellow's offhand cheerful recognition, sometimes accompanied by a passing pleasant word or two. Whatever that equivocal young person's original design may really have been, or the design of which he might have been the deputy, certain it was from his manner upon these occasions that he had wholly dropped it.
It was as if his precocity of crookedness, and every vulgar villain is precocious, had for once deceived him, and the man he had sought to entrap as a simpleton had, through his very simplicity, ignominiously baffled him. But shrewd ones may opine that it was hardly possible for Billy to refrain from going up to the afterguardsman and bluntly demanding to know his purpose in the initial interview so abruptly closed in the forechains. Shrewd ones may also think it but natural in Billy to set about sounding some of the other impressed men of the ship in order to discover what basis, if any, there was for the emissary's obscure suggestions as to plotting disaffection aboard. Yes, shrewd ones may so think, but something more, or rather something else than mere shrewdness, is perhaps needful for the due understanding of such a character as Billy Budd's. As to Claggart, the monomania in the man, it that indeed it were, as involuntarily disclosed by Starts in the manifestations detailed, yet in general covered over by his self-contained and rational demeanor, this, like a subterranean fire, was eating its way deeper and deeper in him. Something decisive must come of it.